So, what kind of equipment do you think you need to shoot your pets? Camera. Camera. Patience. Patience. <laughs> Sedate the dog. <laughs> Apparently, it works for him. So, yeah, maybe I should try that. Anything else? I have a lot of treats available. Treats. That's a good one. Yeah. Treats. So. I, in the, the photos you will see coming up, and I've noticed I have almost no photos of our dog, because uh, Jameson is in two states, either sedated all the time, like 95% of his time is sedated, so he sleeps next to mom, so wherever Megan is, he is sleeping next to her. So taking pictures of a dog that's asleep kind of got a little bit boring sound. Um, and the very few times that he's actually active, he's like running so fast, there is no way you're gonna take any pictures of him. So, um, and that rarely happens. It happened a lot more when he was a puppy and he used to like run out of the house, because that's what puppies do apparently. Um, and I had a dog when I was much younger, but I still lived at home. And uh, he was an American Eskimo, I don't know if you know what that is, that's like a miniature Samoyed. Um, and they're in constant state of running. They never stop. They're the most hyper dog. But he lived outside. And my parents really appreciated it because it was our guard dog in Chicago when I lived in Chicago. So it was a perfect guard dog. Loud, little, obnoxious thing. Perfect. Jameson is the exact opposite. He occasionally growls and he goes back to sleep because that was way too much energy. Um, so I don't have any pictures of him running around and all these cool shots. I keep saying everyone I'm taking. So uh, we're going to have to take him to the park or something. Anyway, uh, most of my shots have been are of cats, because um, they're much more interesting to take pictures of having cats in them. Um, and I've tried both a prime lens and a zoom lens. Uh, a prime lens means it's a fixed focal length, right? 50 millimeter, 85 millimeter are the most popular prime lenses right now. Um, sometimes you'll see a 35 millimeter. Uh, uh, but they're a lot more expensive, and now uh, Sigma and Nikon and Canon, I think, are all coming out with a new 135, which is a perfect portrait lens. Unfortunately, it's, it's very expensive. It's over a thousand or two thousand uh, dollars. The problem I found with um, uh, prime lenses, I mean, there's pros and cons, right? The problem I have with that is, uh, can anyone guess, what's the problem of shooting pet photography with a prime lens? And again, prime means there's no zoom. It's fixed. Yeah. You have to move, right? So uh, that you know, can become problematic when you, when the, the cat or the dog is asleep or in a certain state that you wish to photograph, you move and then they just follow you around or whatever, right? So, the, and what's the benefit of prime lens? Fast sharpness. Yes, good. Those two things. It's the fact that it's not a zoom; it has less movable parts usually less glass and thus sharper, right? So they are sharper than an equivalent zoom lens. I didn't do that, I swear. Is it a timer? Okay, um, so, and then, uh, but they are fast. That means your aperture can go, you know, 1.8, you can get uh, a 50, mill 50 millimeter 1.8 lens for a really dirt cheap, 100 bucks or less, right? 50 bucks, they're really, really cheap. Cam back in the old camera days, they used to come free with your camera, right? Today, it's, you know, it's, it's really inexpensive. I think the 50 millimeter 1.4 from Canon and Nikon is only two two hundred dollars and, and they're, you know, sorry? The body, yeah. And they're about, you know, they're great lenses. Uh, so they're fast. Aperture, uh, very small, well, large aperture on them, so lots of light coming in. But what's the, the downside of that? Those that didn't show up. Pretty good, everyone listened. Awesome. Yes. Uh, you're, you're, uh, everyone will complain, you know, I can't use this lens. Is there something wrong with this lens? I get that a lot. You know, when I recommend a prime lens to someone, they shoot pictures with it, inevitably they'll come and tell me, I can't use this lens. There's something wrong with it. And then I'll look at it. 
and I noticed they're not focused where they think they were focused, and they have, because you're shooting at such a large open aperture, your, your depth of field is minute, right? So, you'll see some pictures of cats when you're lucky enough that the cat doesn't move and you focus exactly on its eyeball, perfect shot. If I move a little bit or the camera does, it's not on its eyeball, it's on its ear, it looks like, oh, there's something wrong with the camera or, or the lens or me, right? But so uh, that is the downside and the upside of a prime lens. Zoom lens. Most common zoom lens today, the standard zoom lens is about 25 to 70 ish. You know, they come for um, a few hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars, depending uh, which one you buy and uh, how fast it is. Uh, but they're great lenses because you, you, you zoom in, you can sit on the couch, the cat or dog or other pet uh, is. Uh, sleeping on the couch uh, or on the floor, and you can zoom in to get the perfect picture, right? You don't have to get up. Uh, but there are downsides to that. One, they're not as fast as a prime lens. I've never seen a 1.8 zoom lens. Maybe one doesn't exist, I've never seen it. Full frame. Uh, and uh, it's almost always not as sharp as its equivalent prime, okay? It's hard to say always because uh, these days, you know, the technology in the zoom lenses, there's, you know, there are standard zoom lenses that cost $3,000 and they're really incredible lenses, right? Uh, so that's what we shoot with. Um, I love this. So I, mean, I have both brand cameras, so I don't get into the wars between Canon and Nikon. Um, so th this is actually someone's setup, which is actually really cool. One thing I never, never use, um, unless I'm outside, uh, when shooting pets is what? What was that? Telephoto lens. Telephoto lens, yep. What else? The flash. The flash, oh. right? Uh, I try to turn off the flash at all times. Why? Yeah, it scares the pets, right? And if it doesn't scare, at least they'll grab his attention, right? I like taking, um, someone mentioned it, that you shoot the pet's character uh, or personality, right? If you're going to flash something out there, that moment is gone, right? You'll see some. Uh, some pictures of the cats and some dogs out there where I really try to catch their personality. Uh, I presume everyone has pets here, so you all know how personalities are with, with cats and dogs. And all right, any, any uh, questions about camera gear? So you can usually, you can use anything you've got. No one says to be good at shooting your pets, you have to buy this. You know, uh, I'm all, if everyone, if I were to hear that from anyone, I immediately, my radar goes up and I'm like, eh, know about that, you know? It's, the camera's a tool. If you know how to use the tool, then you should be able to take good pictures, right? It's just a tool. Um, and one tool is not the best in all situations. Um, like I said, I don't have pictures of my dog running around and, and, and you know, caught uh, in the motion. Uh, I just don't have that. Um, a good buddy of mine has an American Bulldog with all the big sloppy things. She's so beautiful. Uh, you always see this picture of a dog going like this and all its folds going and it's, I've tried so many times to get that picture and it's not working for me. Uh, so I had to steal some of those, they're so awesome. But one day I will get that photo. Uh, she just doesn't stand still enough. And you think a dog that's like 80 pounds and like barely off the ground and will not be as mobile as Sophie is, but boy. Um, she is. And you know, when I try to put my nightstand out, guess what's the first thing she tries to do? <laughs> so it doesn't work for me very well. Um, but that is a goal. That is a goal I have to do this year. Any questions about e equipment and gear? Okay. A, a lot of the pictures I noticed that I've taken was with my camera phone, right? Because it's always with you when you walk the dog, um, you know, when your cat's outside or whatever. You don't have a camera, but there's a moment you want to capture, right? And the camera phone does, it's better than nothing. And I've noticed some of my pictures are really, really good with my camera phone. So no one says you have to buy $12,000 worth of equipment. Oops. Okay, use natural light. Uh, I think that was Zena a long, long time ago. Um, avoid the flash. Again, we can start with pets. Um, I don't like hot shadows of uh, flash. Now we've had lens, we've had uh, classes in the past where we talked about uh, 
how to put diffusers and how to bounce flashes and do all those kind of tricks. Probably do a bigger class than that later in the year. Um, they do work sometimes, but still, there, there's a startling sound that comes out of that flash, right? No flash is silent. Oh, yeah. And that's just enough to, to, well, to distract. Well, when it's charging up because of their hearing. That's right, that's right. Yeah. They hear, they hear, but they hear. Right, that's right, yeah. We may not hear it, but they will hear the, the charge of sound yeah. and get distracted from that. That's right, that's a good point. And I have a 10-year-old speed light an icon one, and it doesn't make a lot of sound, but yeah, for them it probably does. Enough to get them out of whatever mood they're in that you want to capture. We can't hear it, but they can. But they can, yep, mm -hmm. exactly. And it makes everything look cold, right? It makes everything just white. Um, so this is on my desk hutch. Um, when I used to have it, I took it off now because it became more cumbersome than that. But the cats are not working, so my monitor is down here, so I'm sitting at my desk. This is the hutch over my desk next to a window. The cats love to just sit uh, on there, uh, either go to sleep or just watch what I'm doing, which kind of creepy out there. <laughs> um, but that's what cats do, right? They make you feel creepy a lot of times. All right, um, so, uh, and as you can see, it's right next to a window. So I just happen to have my camera uh, on my desk, snap the picture. Um, she was probably thinking very nasty thoughts about she wants to do with me, um, but it turned out to be a really, really nice picture, right? So, uh, and that's all natural light is good. So if, if you can't use your window, you know, go outside. A lot of my cats have always been outside cats. They go outside for a while, meander, and come back in. So I have a, a lot of pictures of cats outdoors, which is really nice, uh, works, works nicely there. Uh, if you have the dog, and, and my backyard is not fenced in. Um, if you have, to have a, you know, if you do happen to have a fenced in uh, in the backyard, those are opportunities for you to take pictures of your dog outside. Any questions about natural light? Know where to focus, right? Um, if, if you ever look at every high fashion magazine that has uh, the top of the model uh, as the majority of the picture, not the whole body, but the, the face. Um, they're always focused at the eyes, right? That's where the focus is, always at the eyes. Um, eyes are the windows to the soul, uh, and they are much more expressive, but it's very difficult because cats and dogs, and I, I would presume some lizards. Uh, who here has not a cat or a dog with some other kind of pets? What do you have? I have a pet rock. <laughs> I bet you like, I bet those are some good shots on <laughs> Shutter speed's important. Who else has a pet other than a cat and dog? Yes. Chickens, those are cool. I have a, um, did you catch it in the wild? <laughs> Anyone else? No one has lizards? Yes. I photographed the pot, from the pot color cave. They're a pot. Yeah, those are <laughs> faster moving things, yes. Oh. Yes, horses. Horses, very nice. Yeah, there's a Spring Valley Nature Preserve in, I believe it's Schaumburg. Um, they had, I presume they still have a, a living farm with uh, cows and horses, and it's not very far. Um, it's off of Meacham and uh, Schaumburg Road, I believe. It's a, it's a Village owned nature preserve, but they have a farm in the back. And it's really nice. I take the, the kids there. Um, even the nature preserve is, is really well done for a small village owned area. So, uh, but I have horse pictures that I took there. Their, their horses are very expressive, beautiful animals. Yes. Pine Creek farm. Off of, oh, yeah, yeah, Pine Creek, yes. Yeah, they, they have a farm which is right down the road from me. But, yeah, they have everything there. Do they have horses too? They have horses. They have Cows, they have chickens, they have cats, they have oh. you name it, they have. I know the prairie well, path dogs. The prairie path goes right by there, so I've yeah, I've well by there, it's but uh on what the county farm road and uh between, between, Jewel, between yeah, yeah, Jewel, yeah. Geneva Road, oh, Saint Charles. Good. So opportunity oh, yeah. for it's for animals. It's open later in the week. it's open Thursdays. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Over the weekend. Yeah. yeah. Based and 
it can get crowded. If you go by and you see it's lambing season, they have to sign. Right. Uh, Those lambs are big. Pardon? Those lambs are already big. Yeah, but I mean, they still got the big sign. <laughs> so, you know, there might be a couple that are late. I had a, a friend who worked together in my previous job, and uh, he had a big lizard. Um, and he always brought pictures of his big lizard at work. Um, and lizards don't move very much. Uh, and he loved photography too, and he had a macro lens. So it's incredible to get really close ups of a lizard's face and scales with a macro lens. Um, uh, uh, unimaginable stuff. But I sent him an email that he didn't respond, so maybe his email address is different. But I would love to use some of the pictures he got. Um, I don't think a lizard would last in our house with two cats very long. <laughs> Anyway, all right, so aim for the eyes. It's much easier said than done, right? Because cats and dogs move a lot, um, especially their heads, even if they're in rest. So to capture them, um, patience is key, right? You have to sit somewhere, pretend you're ignoring them, they'll pretend they're ignoring you, and try to take the shot. Um, usually it doesn't happen. Sometimes you're lucky and you may get the shot that you're looking for. Um, and again, both of these cats are now gone, unfortunately. They passed away last year, but they were very, very expressive for what we had them. So the cats we have now are not very expressive. Um, all right. Um, the other thing, I, you have to get down to the level of your pets. You know, we, we talked about it in past um, classes about not shooting everything at eye level, which is much more boring, you know, much more common when you shoot everything at eye level because we all see things at eye level, right? So either get down on the ground or get up on a ladder or use some sort of high difference of whatever you're shooting to make it much more interesting, right? Um, same thing applies with pets. Uh, it wasn't this person that we saw earlier, but there was another uh, presentation I was looking at at YouTube. And they said, you know, get down to their level to see how they see things, right? It's easy to take a pet from on top, from our height, but once you get down to their level and see things how they see things, it might, you know, it, it, it will make your pictures a lot more interesting. Of course, if some of us are not 20 years old anymore, so that becomes more of a problem than not. Um, but uh, especially when the dog is running in the backyard. Um, but I saw someone actually, uh, there's a dog three houses over, and his grandkids were over, and they were taking pictures of the dog. Um, so they were simply throwing the ball back and forth, and the dog was running back and forth. And uh, the photographer, she uh, sat on the grass and they threw the ball back and forth from her. And when the ball came, the dog was coming at her and she was able to take the pictures as the ball came. But it wasn't coming at her, it was going to the ball. The dog was going to the ball that was behind her, right? But she was in a perfect spot to take the pictures of the dog coming. And she was, you know, a, a teenager. So she was down to the ground with the camera, you know, probably doing something for school or for fun or whatever, but it was, uh, then I saw the picture, I'm like, wow, that was awesome, right? Get down to the ground um, and use a distraction so they don't pay attention to you. Um, and it worked out really well. So I haven't seen her since, I still have photo, but it was awesome, it was awesome. And it worked that way. Um, and then so the my friend said, well, what if, this dog is huge, but I don't know, it's like a golden retriever mix with a mastiff or something, it's a huge dog. Um, what if the dog, crashes into you, right? One thing that dogs never do is crash into you, right? If you don't move, they will perfectly avoid you. They have built-in sonar. So, or radar, radar. Uh, so as long as you don't move, they'll go around you, right? They're not gonna crash into you. Uh, so it, it always works. They will, even if, you know, unless they hit you with the ball, you know, I only do that with my kids, I don't do that with strangers. Um, but as long as you know the ball is over, they'll just jump over you perfectly or go around you or whatever. Um, so try it. Um, I don't know how we can try with our dog. But we'll give it a shot. But anyway, get down to the ground, right? Um, if it's difficult to do, put your camera. A lot of our cameras now have displays that come up and stuff, you know, so you can have it at different angles. I do that when I shoot flowers and macro photography. It's usually, you know, I don't get dirty on the ground all the time. But you can use that display to look up, which is really handy. That, that helps a lot too. All right. Pets have character. They're Sophie on the left. Uh, I couldn't get her to do that wild slobbery thing all over the 
the place. One day I will. Um, but they always have character. Uh, they, you, know, and you can see it. You can see it in their eyes, in their face. And Seth, what's the dog's? Uh, the dog on the right is my brother. He's dog Jones. Jones. Okay. Beautiful picture. What you said there was something wrong with this picture? Didn't you? Well, was, um, the uh, yeah, I had the uh, the aperture open, open pretty wide, so it's funny. His nose was totally out of focus, but his eyes were uh, ah. in focus. So <laughs> long snout. Long snout. You don't. Well, I mean, I compressed the picture to this size, so you don't see it as much, probably. But I thought it was a beautiful picture, so I, I borrowed it. But uh, they all have characters, whether it's cats or dogs or even an iguana, right? They all have interesting characters and try to capture that moment. Um, and, and especially if they're not you know, necessarily looking exactly at you. It's, it's a lot of fun. Go macro. So, you know, do you need a macro lens? Uh, and, uh, you know, we've covered this before, but the word macro has been used a lot over the ages. Uh, macro means basically you can focus one-to-one, -one, right? So you can get an image as big as you see it. And macro lenses are much more expensive than other lenses because focusing them one-to-one -one means you can focus really, really, really close to that lens <coughs> within an inch or two. The, uh, the glass, the front glass of your lens. That's what I mean by one. So that's what a macro lens allows you to do, is focus really, really, really close, you know, within an inch or less. So therefore, you know, you can get a, a really, uh, uh, you know, if you're shooting 24 megapixels or more, you're gonna get a huge resolution on a very small area, okay? You don't need a macro lens to shoot. A uh, question? Yeah. Would a macro, and I'm not sure I'm using the right term, so sure. I apologize, the extending tubes or? Extension. Yes, so um, you don't have to, you can get, uh, you can get your uh, focus distance much closer to that lens by using extension tubes, that is correct. Yep, uh, and that's the key, right? The key is to put your camera as close as possible. That's what a macro lens allows you to do because it magnifies the image in your picture. Uh, another thing you can do is use a long lens, right? Uh, you know, 200 millimeters, 300 millimeters. A 70 to 300 millimeters right now is a few hundred dollars. Uh, you know, they're, they're very inexpensive. A standard one, you know, not a big fast focus seven pound lens. Uh, they're a few hundred dollars and a lot of burgers that we see going up and down, they all have some sort of a long lens. The problem with the long lens, of course, is it's, it's minimum focus distance is usually five to six feet. Right? It wasn't meant to focus close um, at 300 millimeters. Right? Usually macro lenses don't go, I think the, the, the highest focal length macro lens I've seen is 150. I don't think I've seen anything beyond that. 180, yes. Um, and, then, and that's within two, three inches of the fronts. Um, the standard ones, the 100, I think uh, Nikon came up with a 60 millimeter macro last year or something. That could go really, really close to the front. Um, so shoot macro, which means shoot very, very close. It doesn't mean necessarily you need a macro lens, right? You can cheat. You can use extension tubes in your lens to try to bring the camera. Now normally what I do, if a cat's sleeping, I'll leave the camera there so they can get used to the camera being there. They'll go back to sleep. Um, and then slowly I'll take the picture. Um, so, uh, she didn't have a problem with this. You can't get anything past that one, or you couldn't at that time. She would always has one eyeball on you every year. <laughs> so you can never get away with that. Uh, but Blondie used to sleep for everything. She was, was a treasure. Uh, but shoot close. And it's amazing, as you can probably see the detail out of the hair, um, a lot of the beautiful detail when you get that close, right? Um, it's amazing the stuff that you actually see when you're that close. Uh, so try to get as close to the, the pet as possible. Um, I, during this session, I think, uh, I couldn't find this picture. I, I'm not sure where I saved it, but um, I just had a picture of her paw, literally just her paw. So you can see her paw here, and it focused on her on her eyes. Then I reversed it. I, uh, she moved her paw a little bit. So I had the, just the top of her paw, um, and she, her face was still in the background, and I focused on the paw, rather than the face. So it was an incredible picture, and I printed it once, um, and I'm sure I saved it in a perfectly safe place. <laughs> Not sure where, but it's safe wherever it's at. But you see the details of the paw, and I mean, you know, in, 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 in 
huge up close detail, which gives you a little bit different perspective of your of your pet. And then her face is kind of like blurred to, to almost this, not not as much as this, but to almost of that quality. So you know there's a cat back there asleep, um, but the paw. So play around like that. Uh, and it's, it's a lot of fun uh, to do that kind of stuff while your pet is uh, sleeping or sedated like my dog is. Um, so one day I will get my pet running, um, just not right now. Um, surprise them. So patience, see the moment, and, and then try to capture that moment, right? Uh, Tiffany loves sleeping on things. Uh, our two cats today love, love sleeping on our daughters. Uh, so, yeah, kind of weird, but uh, that's how they are. Uh, so try to capture the moment. Um, I do want to capture one day a picture of our dog running like that. Um, again, get to the ground and have a fast camera. You know, this is outside, sunny, um, fast shutter speed. Notice um, it's the, the, the depth of field is really, really small, right? And what do I mean by that? Notice how much of the grass is in focus, right? Within two inches, maybe? Um, but the person focused on the dog is the dog was running. Now, all of our cameras, if you have a camera within the past uh, five years, a DSLR with five years, it has continuous focus on it, right? So it has single focus and continuous focus. The, the whole idea of continuous focus is that it will track the object as it's moving. Yeah. Um, uh, that's the whole idea. It doesn't always work perfectly. Um, the much more expensive cameras can do it much better than the not as expensive cameras. But the whole idea is that the object's moving, but yet the camera is still tracking the in focus that object. Yes? You know, just kind of a point on that before when you're talking about focusing on the eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, how you focus, you know, even here, notice um, this is just a, a, a basic recliner. She's almost in the middle. So between the, the recliner and her face is maybe, you know, less than a foot, 10 inches. But notice how out of focus 10 inches is. And this really brings it, you know, uh, how much grass is in focus, maybe two, three inches. Really the same plane as the dog's face, because notice, uh, I don't know if you See it really, but the, the tail and the hind part of the dog is not in focus versus the front, right? So uh, they took the picture of the face as the dog was running. So uh, our cameras go everywhere from nine to 39 focus points, right? Depending on, on the, the, the cost of your camera. So typically, you know, uh, an 800 DSLR, I think the, the Nikon, um, 3300 and the Canon Rebel, I don't know what the small Rebel's name is anymore, five iris or whatever, um, they come with nine focus points. And that seems to be a nice spatial dispersion of the, the, the focus points around the, the image that you should be able to get more, you know, a good amount of stuff. But as the cameras get more expensive, as you go from the Nikon 3300 to the 5300 to the 700 and up, the price scale, you get more and more focus points and it gives you more capability on how to control those focus points, right? You can leave it on auto, and the camera will create, you'll see a whole bunch, and that's basically when a whole bunch of dots line up when you half click, right? When you see a whole bunch of dots, um, that means the camera has defined its own focal plane, okay? So that's what those dots do. It's created its own focal plane, which could be on the face or not. Um, it's guessing where you want to focus, um, and then you're going to go, once you press the shutter all the way, it's going to take the picture. Or you can put it in manual focus mode, right? And then, um, and I don't mean well, switch the lens to manual focus where you actually have to focus. I mean, you, you yeah. take control of those dots, right? So uh, when you take it, you're still focusing automatically, but you're taking control of each of those dots. And some of you, some cameras let you take control of only one dot. That's usually the, the common thing for, for cameras that only have nine focus dots. You can only control one focus dot. Um, I think my 800, you can control uh, nine dots out of 39, you know, a little squares worth. 
and you can move the squares where you want it. I think on a D4, I've seen like uh, a whole polygram worth of dots that you can move where you want. So the whole idea is um, when you're not in autofocus uh, mode, uh, you get to define where you want it to focus, to, to focus on. And in continual, it will focus only one dot or uh, a, a plane of dots, you know, uh, four, uh, four or more dots that create a plane of focus, like which probably happens here. Question? Yes. Sure. If you only have the one focus dot uh -huh. and you have two eyes, what do you do? Focus on one of them. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a good question. Because a lot of times you'll hear the person say focus between them. The problem I have with that is when you focus between them, your chances are neither one will be in focus. Right? That's your problem. Um, if you're perfectly perpendicular to your pet and your pet is sedated, they're not going to move, um, it might work, right? Um, and it depends on your depth of field. Because um, uh, not this one, but uh, 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 our other cat had a very long nose bridge, right? Uh, she, Tiffany, had a very flatter nose, but uh, Blondie had a much, so if I focused between the eyes, the eyes would not be in focus. Because it would probably be good, you know, centimeter, maybe three quarters of a centimeter between the, her nose or, or the ridge between her eyes and her eyeball. And that's, if you're shooting at 1.8, that's enough to throw your focus off, right? Because your focus, your depth of field is razor sharp at 1.8. Okay, so I would, and, and if you're not perfectly perpendicular to them, if one eye is closer to you than the other eye, then you're not, both eyes are not going to be in focus, unless you're shooting at f8 or something. So that the depth of field is, you know, much greater uh, in front of the eyeball and in back of the eyeball. Okay, uh, so you can do that. You can focus on the one eyeball, shoot at f8 to get both eyeballs in focus if they're not perfectly perpendicular to you. Um, but I, I like focusing on one eye, the eye that's closest to me, and let the other eye go. You kind of get a more interesting look, okay? But very good question. Because yeah. you're not gonna control two independent focus points to focus on two eyes, that's not how it works. Um, you're focusing either one, you're, you're controlling either one focus point or a group of focus points that move together, right? You're not going to get disparate focus points to be able to do that. Another question, yes? My camera has a, what's called a face recognition mode, and you will put a box on the face and focus on the whole face itself. Yes, so there are, you know, our, our newer cameras not have a lot of tricks to them, right? Uh, and does it work with pets? Have you tried it with pets? I haven't tried it with a pet, but now that you're talking yeah, about it. I've never seen anyone say absolutely that it works with pets. I've seen it work with people, right? Yeah. Um, and even, you know, the Facebook recognizer, it's kind of the same concept, right? When you upload a photo to Facebook, it knows um, where the face is in your photo, and even scarier, it recommends who it is in the right. <laughs> um, but it kind of works on the same concept, right? It kind of recognizes a face object in the eyes, and it will say, okay, that's where you want to focus. But I wonder if it'll work with pets. Um, and I, I don't know anyone who's tried and say, yes, it does, or no, it doesn't. It'd be interesting to see. I'll try it. Yeah, it would be cool. Do you have cats or dogs? Yeah. yeah, it'd be interesting to see if it works. Sorry? I was just making a snipe comment. Oh, okay. <laughs> he takes the picture and then posts on Facebook, so we all know the answer. Yeah, I mean, let us know on our Facebook page, you know, whether it works or not. You can find a green cat, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I don't have a green cat. Green cat. Green cat. But no, that'd be uh, that'd be just the way that works. All right. Um, so surprising them. You know, patience is key with with animals. Uh, and uh, you know, I heard treats. Right? Treats works with dogs, not so much with cats. Uh, but squeaky toy. Yeah, that's another good thing that will work. Uh, of course, Iron Dog will like kiss his head off and go, <laughs> that's what he did. Uh, but surprise them. Um, you know, she was sleeping, um, and she she's usually the one that will always keep an eyeball on you, no matter what. She always knew what was going on in the room. But I caught her finally totally asleep. Um, that, <laughs> I don't think we have this thing anymore. His name was Pete. Uh, it's, it's the 
literally had a tag on it. It was called Venus. Uh, and uh, she always used to sleep on it. Uh, but uh, anyway, any questions about the pets? All right, and basically have fun. Um, that's our dog last year, or two years ago. That's the year we got him. So it's two years ago. He was a puppy. Too bad he's not a puppy anymore. Why don't they just stay small? <laughs> Um, and yeah, as you can see, he doesn't run around a lot, but I really like the way his coloration when he was young, younger, um, and the weeds that were out in front of my yard kind of mixed together, right? And he loves sitting in that spot. Uh, now he's much bigger, and that spot is gone because I'm putting grass there now. So, uh, so just have fun. Take a lot of pictures. Um, <laughs> uh, that's my wife's cat. I have to claim no ownership to that. <laughs> um, actually, I think I have this picture that we will play with um, and see how we came up with that picture. So we crop it and build a whole bunch of other stuff to actually come with this picture. Um, he, he usually will stare you down just like he does in that picture. Uh, he is evil, and we don't be called Satan for a reason. Uh, for those of you that, that have seen Satan. Um, and uh, both of these cats, unfortunately, oh, wait, no, that's Zena. So when I got Blondie, uh, these were twins. They were from the same litter, Blondie and Zena. Um, Zena passed away early, uh, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, Blondie passed, she was almost 16. So she passed away just a couple of years ago. Um, and the cool thing about them, and I've, I've been looking back in my pictures of that, they were always together. Have you ever had pets that were always together? I mean, they would not leave each other alone. If one cat went somewhere, the other cat went there too. So I've got tons and tons of pictures of two fur balls, um, one perfectly blondish, one perfectly darkish, and they're always just mixed up. Um, so it was always cute, and that was, uh, they were very photogenic. Um, they, they totally, they were amused by the fact that people wanted to take pictures of them. Um, so that was a, a lot of fun, always trying to take pictures of them. Um, all right. Any questions? Oh, and looking back at my pictures, I had a, uh, I used to have, you know, back after college, long, long time ago, in the galaxy far, far away, um, I used to have fish. Uh, I used to raise, this is an angel fish, for those of you that know what that is. Um, it, was a, it was a lot of fun, uh, and I look at my pictures and I'm like, wow, these are all so bad. Uh, I couldn't show them. So I told my wife today, you know what, we should get fish. Um, just to try more of this photography stuff, right? You know, who's gone to the aquarium downtown and tried to take pictures of like their jellyfish display? You know, you would think with all that light, it's an easy thing to do. No, not so easy. Um, or unless you're outside in the tanks taking pictures, even though they're lit, of the animals moving through the glass is quite the challenge. Um, so I'm looking at these pictures and I'm like, ah, there were some great pictures I wanted to show, but they were not. Um, uh, the Subject-wise, they were interesting, uh, but quality, you know, picture quality-wise, they were just horrible. And we're talking, what, 20 years ago? Uh, so it'd be interesting to get a fish tank just to try a lot more pet photography with things that can't run away from you. So, all right, any questions about pets? What time is it? Okay, we're doing good on time. Nope? Who here shoots a lot of uh, photos of their pets? At one point I did, uh, when my son picked up a tortoise, when it was still tiny, I was putting a little skateboard. <laughs> I have a reef aquarium, and I, I take a lot of saltwater fish. Nice. Because I like snorkeling. So that's where I practice. Very nice. Yeah, I had some acreage before, and did a lot of animal rescue, and then 16 animals, so and dogs and cats, and horses and birds. Nice. For all pets. It was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I heard some pictures of horses that I was going to make it into the, the presentation of the horses out at Spring Valley, which was, uh, which was really nice. Uh, anyone else? Everyone? Yes. Yeah, I don't touch anymore, but most of my adult life is a cat. You know, and it's one of the things that I wonder when I get my particular behavior that they have, well, how do you get somebody to help you? So you have somebody else actually interacting with the animal. Mm -hmm. So they're not that aware of you after you're shooting. Uh, makes a big difference. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, and like the dog, my neighbor's dog, you know, I distracted with the ball while one person was taking the picture. You know, distract them that way so you can get the shots that you want. Now I was looking at some of the YouTube, like that uh, the one Pete and Seth showed us, 
of them. You know, it's like, I don't know how these professional photographers have the patience to do stuff like that. You know, it's just, it was just crazy. You think kids are crazy, try pets. And you know, I, one picture that I saw was like three pets, like practically hugging each other. I don't know if someone's seen that very famous photo and how they took it. It's like, wow. I'm sorry? Velcro. Yes, Velcro. That it, it fixes everything. Right, anything else about pet photography? Yes? Earlier, you were talking about the sound that the uh, flash can make as it's powering up. Another distraction is the shutter sound. A lot of the cameras will allow you to adjust the volume. It's best with them to put it to zero so you don't have a shutter sound. Yeah, very good point. So we have three kinds of cameras today, right? We have the standard, I didn't bring my camera back. Uh, the standard DSLR, which has that mirror that's gonna go up and down, and there's nothing you can do about it, right? You're gonna hear that mirror slap go up and down. One thing you could do it is lock the mirror up, right, and then take the picture. Uh, but that gives you opportunities for shake and not getting the moment right and all that other stuff. But you can certainly lock it up and take the shot. Uh, then you have you know, the electronic cameras that have a shutter sound, and then there's no real shutter in the camera, right? Because even these things, I think by default, these things come with a shutter sound when you hit the shutter. There's no shutter in the front, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it just makes it sound because it's, it's supposed to be a camera. Uh, and it, you can turn it off, right? So uh, a lot of the mirrorless uh, cameras today, which are the biggest thing uh, between Sony, I think Sony's the leader in the mirrorless cameras. Uh, but Canon and I kind of try to do it. You know, they're small, full frame, beautiful, you know, beautiful cameras, and they have they don't have a mirror, and, and they have an electronic uh, viewfinder, and you can turn if you're so used to that shutter sound to make sure you took the picture, you could turn that on or off. Yeah, you know. but if you're going to spend four thousand dollars mirrorless camera, why would you want it on? But anyway, but yeah, so. On uh, or point and shoots, right? Point and shoots don't have uh, a mirror usually, but they have the sound, so you can turn that off to avoid it. Great. Anything else? All right. Um, so let me let's talk a little bit about editing. There is a software called Paint.net, um, and it is purely it's free. Right? Here's the website. Uh, the problem, because it's free, is that uh, there are imitators that try to get you to come to their page, um, and they'll either give you a poor imitation of the software, or it'll give you a virus or a trojan or something else, right? Uh, uh, I'm an IT guy that works for a pharmaceutical company. Uh, we have people like at work type in uh, free PowerPoint templates. You know, we all want cool templates for our presentations and stuff. And I'd say half of my users will come back with the virus. Or my antivirus software will pop up on my screen that says this guy did something very, very bad. Um, and that's because the pages look totally legit, right? You think you're getting a free, but free is usually the search word for you're going to get a virus. Yay! Mm -hmm. So be careful when you do type free. Um, even in this page, this is the legitimate paint.net uh, uh, web page. But notice they have a lot of advertisement, right? If you're gonna look at this page and not read it, the first thing you wanna do is what? Click on that big download button, right? That's, that's, but that big download button is gonna get you the software, right? This big download button is gonna get you this thing, the doc to PDF thing, right? Not gonna get you the software. So now you're stuck, and sometimes they don't even give you the option of saying no. You click on that, it automatically starts installing. Uh, you bring up Chrome or, um, or your browser or whatever, and it's got five windows that loads up automatically, and you say, what the heck just happened? So bad things happen. Um, then you go, the big green button is not it, right? So the next big button is it, right? Uh, no, that's not it. Uh, that's not gonna do it. Because this is gonna download something that's called Easy PDF Combine. Yeah, right. I don't know what that means, but okay. So that's not gonna work either. So um, there are actually a lot more buttons under the screen, right, that you don't see. Um, but you need to, if you read, it's not going to work, um, but if you read um, on the upper right, it says get it now, free download, that's your actual link. Okay. But unfortunately, a lot of these vendors, they create the software and they need to make some return on it, right? So they have a lot of this advertisement on there, want you to click, um, and they usually get paid by the amount of clicks that people do on their page. 
that's why you have all this mess. They'll even have a donate. Um, and I think the first time I ever used this, I donated five bucks because it was worth it. Um, so there's the, the website. It's called www.getpaint.net. Um, if you have a Windows machine, I don't know about a Mac, but I presume for a Mac too, uh, you come with an accessory called Paint, right? It's default in Windows, all versions of Windows that I'm aware of. And I presume an equivalent is available on the Mac Touch. Uh, so this is like an expanded version of it. When I started using this, and usually it was at work, because I needed something that's a little bit better than Paint. Um, so Paint.net, um, and I started to use it, and it was, uh, gives you a lot more capabilities than what just Paint does. Now, and by now I mean in the past year or so, it incorporated layers. So for those of you that use Lightroom and Photoshop and know what layers are, it's really cool now to have a piece of software that's totally free and be able to do layers, right? And we'll probably have a little bit of time for me to show you what. I like when I publish something, um, I like putting my signature on it or copyright or something. Um, I don't like putting it on the actual image itself because I'll get bored with what I just did and I want to move it and change it. But then you got to redo the image. You could put it on its own layer. So if you don't like it, you can change that layer, delete the layer, create a new layer, and you're not touching the image itself, right? So, but you can do a lot more stuff with layers. It's not as uh, complex as layers in Photoshop, right? Layers in Photoshop is its own you know, nine month class, but certainly the basics of layers in Photoshop and Lightroom, it will do and it does it for free. Oh, and documentation. Uh, it's all user-based, users create this. It's really, really good. Um, and it starts off with some of the things we'll do right now, uh, but it goes into how to do cool stuff uh, and it, as a part of the tutorial for documentation. And you can download this PDF of the, off of that website, okay? Really, really, really cool. All right, so let me just show you paint. Again, totally free. Here's the icon. Uh, it looks a lot like any other uh, editing software. Let's bring up a photo. Can you repeat the website again, please? Oh, sure. Actually, let me just bring it up. Probably be the easiest thing. You see it up there in the upper left? www.getpaint.net. Getpaint.net. Getpaint.net. Thank you. If you, if you like try to Google free paint, again, you're gonna get, the free word is, is, is bad in search engines. You get all this junk that you don't really want. All right, so let's go back to this. I got two pictures, let's do Satan. Okay, so here's the original picture of Satan. Um, his name is really Satan, um, but his name is Tipsy. So this is our um, family room. He just happened to be sitting there watching me, like Satan usually does. Uh, and so I took the picture, and he did not move, and it was a great opportune moment. But uh, oh, you can't really see it because of all this other stuff here, right? Oh, you can. So it's got, we don't need the history for today. We don't have time for that. Um, we will do layers. So OK. So what are some issues with this photo? Right, the window over here, very bright, doesn't really add anything to the photo, probably want to get rid of it. What else? I'm sorry? Yeah, the photo, that we're not going to be able to remove today, but I think it lets you remove it um, and, and you know, copy this color over to get rid of it pretty simply. Uh, that we won't have time for, to do it today. Uh, it's tilted. I don't know if you can see it on there big, but it's tilted like maybe two, three degrees to the left. Yeah, right. All right, so we're talking about cropping, tilting, and because of the extra light, it's a little bit underexposed. Mm -hmm. right? the, the cat is a little bit too dark right. because as, as we, was it last month? We talked about metering. It used a lot of this extra light in the meter, so then it made the cat darker, right? So. Let's go, and then let's put our, our copyright. So we should be able to do that in 15 minutes. It's so, okay, cropping is easy. Select the part you want. So 
Uh, normally, when I crop for something to publish, I will keep the dimensions of the photo, right? If you, you're usually shooting three by two, um, if you're going to publish something, and publish could be your Facebook album, it could be your website, it could be a crib sheet, it could be whatever, whatever publish means to you, I don't create photos of all different sizes, right? I don't create some square photos, some rectangular photos, some, uh, you know, I try to keep all my photos the same shape, if you will, uh, because it's, it's, much more, it's much better to the eye that way. Uh, sometimes you don't have the flexibility. I, uh, there was an image of uh, uh, of our dog on the ground, and it was you know it was cut this way, right? Because there was way too much chunk behind it, so I had no option but to cut it that way, to crop it that way. Uh, so normally I try to keep everything three by two, especially if I'm showing multiple pictures on one page, right? I don't want them all to be different uh, shapes. Anyway, so. Okay, that took two seconds, right? What did I do? I used the, I do have my pointer. I used the selector button to select. Doug's not here to make fun of me in my pointer. All right, so I use that. That's basically your selector button, right? I use that to very quickly cut uh, uh, the subject that I want to look at, right? So I cut all the blue space that was here, not really relevant. The window is gone, and I'm really focusing on the cat. It's almost center. I would have wanted to avoid the center, but this picture is forcing me to be there. And it really took basically select it, using the select tool right there, and then go image crop. Okay, that's simple. So I crop it. Next thing I want to do is I want to uh, change the coloring a little bit. So everything is done under adjustments. And a lot of these things are called the same thing across all different programs, right? And you'll see the same verbiage uh, of the tools, the name of the tools across all different programs. Uh, auto leveling, let's do that. Usually I don't like what that does. <coughs> okay, I don't like that, what that does, right? So what did I do? It made the picture way, does, is it way too blue? Because I can't see it over there. It, it made it much more bluer. Uh, than normal, but it didn't really do what I wanted to do. Let's go back. I'm old school, control Z meant back in the ancient days, yeah. go back, right? Control C means copy, control X means, you're all like, what? That's a mouse click today, what are you talking about? Old school stuff. All right, so control Z just means undo. So I can undo it real quickly. Uh, so let's do, oh, black and white. This black and white is actually really good. You can switch a picture where you want to black and white. That actually kind of works. Um, only it takes away the distraction of the background a little bit. That picture in the background is way too colorful. Um, and it takes a lot of that away, so that actually works. All right, so the next thing we want to do, again, it's under adjustment. Usually uh, some, picture, some photos have a lot more options. Usually there's a lighting. It's not available here. Uh, I like curves and I like levels, right? I avoid exposure or brightness and contrast. You can certainly play with brightness and contrast. The problem with this is it gives you very small flexibility, right? It's either one extreme or the other, right? You don't have a lot of flexibility. So I can certainly, I, let's move this control over here. And I can play, you know, I want to have it a little bit brighter. You see on the screen it's getting brighter? Is this a JPEG or a RAW? Or this is JPEG. Okay, actually, now I can see a lot of his fur features. <laughs> uh, so, you know, versus here. Right. Ooh, okay. Versus here, you lose a lot of fur features because of his back fur as you're increasing the color, increasing the contrast, get rid of some of that. So as you can see, the picture became, you can see a lot more of the details here because of that. Right? Uh, but it doesn't give you a lot more flexibility than bright 
more write, less write, more contract, less write, contract. Okay. That's why I like things like uh, levels. Levels is also tied directly to the histogram. And the histogram is something we will cover, I think, in the fall. All of our cameras have that histogram when we take a picture. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll call it somewhere, sometime in the fall, I think after the fall colors or during the fall colors, is the class to talk about what this histogram means. And this, it gives you two histograms and they're sideways. It's the same thing as the histogram you see on your uh, camera. Uh, so here, you can deal with, oh, I always want to move this aside so I can see the impact on my photo. But as you can see, I can use the extremes to go darker, oh, um, go back. makes it darker, you can deal with the midtones, make the midtones brighter. Okay, so now I can see a lot more of the detail of this gray fur on top of this other fur. I can change the whole picture. And as you can see, as I'm making changes, what it's doing to the histogram, right? So the histogram tells you the amount of each of these colors uh, in your picture. And as I'm sliding this up and down, you're going to get more of those colors or less of those colors. Uh, and it's all by these levels. If you have what, four of them, five of them, sorry. If you have, uh, you can deal with either of the, uh, the brightness levels, the darkness levels, or your mid tone. Right? I think Photoshop has another pair in there too. Uh, but the nice thing is here is you can, rather than just manipulating bright or dark, you can literally manipulate uh, exactly what you want it to look like. And if you have a nice monitor, this monitor is not, but photo, that's a little bit too bright. But you can see how you change it, right? And we will cover in a different class what all that stuff means. I like manipulating images this way, or curves. Now curves gets a little bit, I use curves a lot when I do astrophotography, because it lets me tease details out of the blackness, right? Uh, you keep making changes to uh, uh, keep boosting the, the pixel power over and over and over again until you start seeing the image. Uh, and basically, the curve, what you want to achieve is an S. Okay. If you have a straight line, you want to make it into an S. As, as much of an S as possible. So what I do is I create anchors. I anchor it there in the center. You know, usually the center is always center. Unless your mid-tones, here probably the blue is my mid-tone. Unless my mid-tone is way off, meaning your picture is like totally red, totally yellow, whatever lighting was available. Unless your midtone was totally off, I usually leave my midtone anchored. And now you can play with these. You can move the curve to your liking. And notice, you know, subtle changes. Oops, I should get it out of the face. Yeah. So you, you know, you can change the points. You can add points. You can move around either side. So this is basically levels, but with a lot more flexibility to how you control all the different brightness um, on, the, on your uh, image, okay? And the nice thing is, you know, people tend to overdo this, and we astrophotographers tend to overdo this too, right? We want to see Andromeda, darn it, we're going to see it now. Um, but you don't, you want to be subtle changes. Keep doing subtle changes. Do 10 subtle changes in your image rather than one huge change. If you do one huge change, you're going to get something that looks like you saw it no, like that. It gets washed out, right? The other thing you can do is when you create your S, is create more anchor lines and really tease out the color. Now, this doesn't have a lot of color, but when you're looking at a landscape image, a foliage image with a lot of colors, um, messing with this a little bit will make huge changes to your Right? And again, you want to deal with incremental small changes, save, make a small change, save. Um, I hid away the uh, history. Um, there was a little drop down here said history. You can undo everything by pointing to the one before that. Right? I like Control Z because I'm old school. You don't have to do that. Um, so those are, okay, we covered cop, prop, we covered image adjustments. Let me briefly color layers. 
Everything as you can see here is one layer background. I want to create a layer. Now these two layers, I can do whatever I want to them and they're independent, right? When I save it, I can flatten them and it becomes one image. Right now they're independent. So with my second layer selected, I want to select my text tool. Create a nice big size so I can actually see it. Uh, I want to create a font that looks like a font that you want. Um, usually script is the popular one. It's down here. Here. Right. You can create the photo, put any symbol you want in there, make it as pretty as you want. Um, and it's part of this layer. I can take away the visibility of that there, and notice you don't see it. It's still there. It's still on that layer I created. I can rename this layer called sign. I can put it back, see how it looks. Right? I think later in the year we cover masking and how you can do little masks in, in, in layers. Um, and that's where a lot of this visibility and opaqueness comes into light. Um, so I've got this layer. I can look at each layer. Um, I can click on the layer I want to manipulate. And I can move this layer around anywhere I want it on my image without messing the actual photo, which is still Oops, there, which is still back there, right? So my photo itself is in this layer, and I have not touched that layer. All my changes I'm making are to this layer. And I can make any change that I got, and I can turn it all off by clicking the button. Okay, that's where layers come, come into being really handy. You can have up to 16 layers, I think, on this software. I think Photoshop gives you like 100 and something. There's a godly amount of layers. Um, but I've tried out this eight layers here, and it doesn't slow down the image at all. It's really, really nice. Okay, any questions? Again, the software is free. Go ahead and download it. You can uh, make these uh, adjustments. It does do a lot more stuff. Uh, if you're very artsy inclined, it has a lot of these special effects that you can do to your photos. Um, layers, adjustments is all the picture adjustments. Um, you can do the regular uh, geo metric type changes like, uh, you know, we'll be flipping stuff around back and forth and so forth and I'm looking the other way instead of at me um, and so forth. All right, any questions about paint.net? Okay, do you guys like the song? Do you guys use something else that you don't care for the song? That doesn't cost several hundred dollars. That's like if you give a shout out for a 50 photo? A 50 photo for the Photoshop is on my desktop upstairs. Uh, Meg and I are usually on our laptops downstairs. I don't want to go upstairs just to do something and push it on our website or on Photoshop. So now it, the fact that we have layers available here, we can do all that stuff without having to power on Photoshop. So it's really handy. And again, it's great. 